Hi, everyone, and welcome to Chats with Changemakers. I'm your host, Tiffany, an 11th grader in Texas, and I participated in Discovery's Future City competition when I was in middle school. Each month, I meet with different guests from the engineering community. Today is Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, and I'm so excited to celebrate with this special episode as part of Discovery's Engineers Week activities. Today, I'm chatting with two engineers who work on the James Webb Space Telescope that was just launched into space on December 25th. Our first guest, Margaret Dominguez, is an optical engineer at NASA. Hi, Margaret. It's great to have you on Chats with Changemakers. Thank you, Tiffany. It's great to be here. Our second guest is Stephanie Hernandez, a systems engineer at Northrop Grumman, who you may remember from a past episode. Stephanie is back again to tell us more about her work on James Webb. Welcome back, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. So excited. I'm going to ask Margaret and Stephanie a few questions to get to know a little more about them. You can ask questions too by typing your question in the Q&A box below and we'll save time to answer some. We also received some audience questions in advance and we'll ask those along the way. Also, be sure to stay tuned until the end of today's session when we will introduce a hands-on engineering challenge you can try at home or in school. So Margaret, let's start with you. I understand the James Webb Space Telescope is the world's largest, most powerful, and most complex space telescope ever built. Can you tell us about the Webb Telescope and what it was designed to do? That's a great question, Tiffany, and you are correct. It is the largest astronomy telescope we've ever launched into space, we've ever sent this far. It's, it's, it's overcome so many challenges because it's so big, it's so cold, and it's so far away. Historically at NASA for the past decades, we've sent you know, dozens of telescopes out into space, but we've never quite done something like what we've done with James Webb. And it stands out because it has a really large primary mirror. And that's like the biggest part of it that allows us to collect a lot of light. If you have a large mirror, um, it's going to be able to collect much more light than for instance, Hubble that has about a third of the, um, the diameter of the mirror of James Webb. It's going to be really big and it's also infrared in our, our uh, well-known Hubble telescope that works in the visible light of the spectrum in the ultraviolet light of the spectrum. And we hear these words a lot because that's something, visible light is something that we can visibly see with our eyes, but we know that other radiation exists, right? We know that ultraviolet radiation exists. We're always concerned about like uh, putting sunblock so we don't get any UV light into our skin because it can cause skin damage. We know that infrared light exists, which is also warm. And then there's X-ray, gamma ray, all these other types of radiations that our eyes are not able to see. James Webb is able to see infrared light. And because it's gonna be so far away and it has mirrors that are specially coded for infrared light, it'll be able to collect light that other telescopes have not been able to do that will allow us to look back in time 13.5 million years ago, which is really exciting. Wow, that's so cool that it can see different parts of the spectrum that we can't even see with our own eyes. Yes. So could you give me a brief overview of this project? What was the timeline from the concept to its launch into space on December 25th? That's a great question. And I wonder if some people have heard a little bit about James Webb because we've had a really long history of James Webb. Actually, the starting of James Webb started like 30 years ago, which is, you know, almost as old as I am, which means it's taken a really long time. And it's not too surprising because a lot of these really big flagship NASA missions take a long time because they're really costly. They're really complicated. So we also don't wanna be rushing through the process. And they're the result of international collaboration. NASA cannot do this on its own. It requires to collaborate. The James Webb is an effort, a collaborative effort with multiple private companies and other um, universities the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency. So it's an international effort that started about 30 years ago. And the way that this works is that every 10 years, we have a group of scientists that come together and they decide which are the most important scientific questions in astronomy that we should answer this decade. James Webb was the winner of the Astronomy Decadal Survey in the year 2000. And now 22 years later, we're finally able to launch it because it's such a big telescope that has overcome so many technical challenges, we've had to take a little bit longer to be able to launch. But that guaranteed that when we launch, 
we're going to be successful. So definitely worth the wait. That's awesome. So Stephanie, how is James Webb different than other telescopes? Great question. I think Margaret touched up on it a lot. First of all, being it is the biggest telescope we have in space, which I and Margaret said is one of the reasons it's been so complicated to get it up in space, but we've gotten it there. Another thing, big difference that unlike other telescopes like Hubble, for example, because it was going so far away, so complex, we only had one shot to make it work. It's not like, for example, Hubble, where it got to space and there were issues and we literally sent astronauts to service it. We didn't have that option with Webb. So it was one of those very crucial one time works. If not, it becomes space junk. So I think that definitely is one of the biggest things that differentiates Webb between other telescopes. And then like Margaret mentioned, we do work in infrared in comparison to other telescopes. I think that's super exciting. And then a little fun fact, for example, for Webb, it's like if it's a we could see a penny 24 miles away from the telescope. So wow. definitely makes it unique from all other telescopes. That's amazing. So what are the main components of the telescope? Yeah, so I like to think there's four major components to the telescope. We have our ISIM, which is basically what houses all of our cameras and all of the instruments. We have the telescope itself, which contains like the primary mirror that Margaret touched up on. And then we have the spacecraft, which has a lot of like the commanding and control um, hardware in there, as well as like other like software in it. Um, and then we have the big sun shield, which is what you can see in the very gray five layers that are the size of a tennis court. And that helps protect the sun or protect the telescope um, and the instruments itself. And then lastly, we, I think, yeah, that's the last one. So basically four major components, um, all of them very unique, very complex. It took so much effort, like Mar Margaret mentioned, over 20 years in the making. Um, yeah. I can't believe it. It's the size of a, that one component is the size of a tennis field or a tennis court. Yes. Yes, it's huge and it's beautiful to see in person in case anybody ever got to see it. So what part of the telescope do you each work on? Margaret, why don't you go first? Thank you, Tiffany. So actually, Stephanie just mentioned it. One of the components is ISIM, the Integrated Science Instrument Module. And that's what I was able to work on when it was being built at Goddard. As I mentioned before, because it is the result of a major collaboration, people like Stephanie and myself that live in opposite sides of the country can collaborate on this project together because it has multiple phases, which means it travels. You know, one part is built one place, one part is built another place, and then they come together in a different place. So I was able to work on ISIM, the instrument module that contains the four scientific instruments that go on board the telescope. So all the pictures that we're gonna see, all the science that we're gonna collect, all the different exoplanets that we're going to see in stars and other solar systems are going to be collected by these cameras that we have on board the telescope. And they're sort of hiding. We, when we really see the picture, the beautiful picture of James Webb that has the primary mirror with the 18 segments that are all golden pretty, the science instruments are hiding behind it. And they're sort of in this black box, so you can't really see them. But there are four instruments there that are, those are doing all of the magic behind the telescope. And that was part of the effort that was working on building that structure that is going to be holding the instruments. It's really funny because Webb is so big that I remember running into somebody that said, you know, at my company in some small town somewhere in the US, we're making each of the bolts that is made, that is gonna go on James Webb. So everybody, you know, it's so big that it doesn't matter what we did, you know, it feels like everybody in some way played a small part, really important small part that all made it possible as a whole. So, and now, you know, James Webb as it, as it is in space, we're still all part of the story and the future of James Webb. So it's a wonderful group effort that, that this has even made possible today. Yeah, that's so amazing that people from all over the world contributed to the project. Yes. So Stephanie, how about you? What part of the telescope did you work on? Yeah, so I worked on the spacecraft. So similar to what Margaret said, I feel like the spacecraft is also kind of hidden. It's building beneath all those five layers of the sun shield, a little box. But even though it's hidden, like Margaret mentioned about the ISM, it's also very important because it has all of our commanding, our steering mechanisms. And it has like the basically the brain computer of all of web that gets us to orbit it helps us command to and from it it helps us communicate with the telescope 
And then also like Margaret mentioned, it was like in literally an international collaboration. There's specific units within the spacecraft that some are made by like Germany, others by Sweden, others by, by like us, by Canada. So it's definitely an international collaboration. And I loved working on the spacecraft because I got to see like the brain behind it, how it, literally how we're able to communicate, how um, like how everything works together, the software. So yeah, that's the part I worked on. That's so cool. So you mentioned both of you mentioned the like international collaboration. So Stephanie, what types of engineers did you work on while designing that? Oh man, I worked with so many different types of engineers. I worked ranging from like the electrical engineers, focusing on like the communications aspect of it. I worked with software engineers, making all of the code to make sure everything worked correctly. I worked with test engineers, many different types of test engineers that took um, the role of making sure everything worked as planned. And again, since we had one shot to make it work, the test engineers were responsible for making sure that, yeah, it worked on the ground, it should work in space. I worked with many technicians as well, who were the ones hands-on making sure everything was um, built correctly. And they were doing, they were on the diving boards. I, I would never be able to do that because I'm terrified of heights, but they were literally on diving boards, making sure everything was clearly, clearly um, built correctly and integrated correctly. Um, yeah, I worked with various, various engineers and all of them have been amazing. One thing I loved about web is there was not one person I didn't love working there. Everybody was so nice, humble, willing to teach every, everybody everything. So yeah, I worked with such amazing people with engineers varying for, from various different things. Wow, it really takes a lot of different skill sets to be able to design something like that. Yes, it definitely does. So we have our first audience question and either one of you can take this one. So who is James Webb? Who is the telescope named after? I can take a stab at it. So he was a NASA administrator. So, um, and that's what we call like the NASA um, main director. So NASA is a really big agency. We have many different centers all over the US. You know, there's a really popular center like in Houston. That's the one that we get in all the Hollywood movies. NASA, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Then we have the really famous uh, center in Kennedy in Florida, Kennedy Space Center. And we have a lot of launches from there. Um, and then we have Goddard, which is here where I work, which is next to Washington, D.C. And if people watch the X-Files, Goddard would come out in the X-Files. So we have many different NASA centers distributed throughout the U.S. And... All of those centers are directed by headquarters, which is in DC. And we have one NASA uh, administrator that coordinates all the centers. Each center has their own center director, but James Webb was a NASA administrator. So we like to um, name the telescopes after people that we think were instrumental in some way to making that telescope possible. And that's why uh, NASA decided to name it after this NASA administrator. That's a cool story. So we have another audience question from Jayla in Ms. Cod's class in Baltimore. This one's for Stephanie. She wants to know what it takes to be a part of NASA. Can you share that and let us know how you got involved with the James Webb Project? Yeah, it's a good question. So I kind of feel like it was such great luck that I ended up um, working here, but I did go when I was in college, I did go to a conference for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, or SHIP. And there, they were showing so many like videos at, um, from Northrop Grumman and NASA showing, talking about the James Webb Space Telescope and how it was like this time machine. It was, it was just so like amazing to see all of that. And I just kept thinking to myself like, wow, it'd be so cool to work on something like that. Like there's no way I would ever be a part of it, but it's so cool. I can't imagine like what these people might feel building it. And then I ended up interviewing with Northrop Grumman and I ended up getting an internship there. And then when I came here, my manager was like, hey, I've put you to work with this person and you'll be working for the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm like, the same James Webb Space Telescope that I saw at the conference? He's like, yeah. And I was so amazed. I was like, oh my God, yes. So I started as an intern there. I worked in all summer. And then when I was still during my last semester in college, I stayed part-time. And then when I came back full time, my manager was like, do you want to continue working on web? Do you want to try something new? I didn't even hesitate. I was like, I want to continue working on web. I love it here. I love the work, the mission, the people. So that's how I ended up working there. That's awesome. So what about you, Margaret? How did you uh, get involved with this project? It's awesome how Stephanie was mentioning her story because I feel like a lot of us have a similar story. I also started as a summer intern. 
I was studying my undergraduate degree in Mexico, where I was born and raised. And I had the opportunity to come do a summer internship at Goddard, where I'm working now, one of these NASA centers. And I was placed in the optics branch. Um, I didn't know that people could become optical engineers. Um, that's what I am now, but that's not what I knew that people could do. And, um, and of course, that was during some of the development for James Webb. And it was all hands on deck. Whomever would come in, this is something that they'd start working on. And like Stephanie was mentioning, it really has been wonderful because everybody that's worked on Webb has been really excited because we know what a flagship mission this is, that we're just... We just want to be part of history, right? We know that Web is going to, um, similar to Hubble, that it really revolutionized our understanding of the expanding universe. We know that Web is going to do something similar. So all of us have been really excited to play even a tiny role in making Web possible. That's really cool the way that you both got connected with this project. So this one is an audience question from Lauren, and either one of you can go first. Um, Lauren is interested in seeing each of your perspectives on what were the biggest engineering challenges in building the telescope. I can start off. Um, I think definitely, like I mentioned, one of the biggest challenges was definitely that whole little voice in the back of your mind always saying like, you have one shot to make it work, like this is it, like there's no, no going back after this. I think definitely that was one of the bigger challenges, making endless testing, endless analyses, yeah, I think for me personally, that was what for me was the biggest challenge. Margaret, do you have anything else that was challenging on your end? I mean, like you said, Stephanie, there's so many things that were difficult about web, right? So um, even, even financial, and people probably heard about this, telescopes that are this big, they cost a lot of money. They are the effort. They are the result of the effort of multiple efforts, right? Personnel efforts, financial efforts you know, schedule efforts. So in order, we had some unexpected um, issues that came up with the telescope and it was really important that we made sure, because like you said, we had one, this was like, we had our window of when we had to launch it. So we had to launch it right. So if ever we saw that there was any issue, we, we, we needed to make sure that we addressed it entirely. Now, one of the other things that I think was really important is that with web, when the idea of web was proposed, we needed to have some technology on the telescope that didn't exist. So can you imagine technology being invented so that it goes on this telescope so that we can send it 1 million miles away from our planet? It's just like ridiculous. And NASA has invented, has patented hundreds of, hundreds of different um, ideas or instruments or devices that are now part of our society, right? And, and part of those um, groundbreaking developments are on web. And that was something that, that was part of the effort. So, you know, so many uh, difficulties to overcome. And that's why we're all really excited that it's finally there and starting to take some first images. It's very, very exciting. That's amazing. So how do you ensure that the telescope is going to work before sending it off to space? I think that's like I mentioned, part of it has to do a lot with endless testing, endless analyses, making sure that we inspect everything correctly. Yeah, a lot of verification is done. We have over, we have thousands of requirements on web because it's so big. So we need to make sure that everything works correctly. So making sure every requirement is met. If it's not making sure that, okay, are we still okay even if we don't meet this requirement? So I think definitely working on the verification, endless testing, bringing in all the knowledgeable experts and people. I know there's people that have come back from retirement to work on web to ensure that, yeah, indeed we had mission success. So yeah, definitely contributed. Margaret, do you have anything else? I'm gonna say, you're, I'm gonna say exactly what you just said, Stephanie, but in a different way. We like to test, 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 and retest. In order to make sure that something is working, we are going to repeat it a lot of times. And we wanna make sure that every time we get the same result, because that is the only way that we know, you know that that's not a one-off. We also learned some lessons from the issues that we had with Hubble. And because we had two tests with Hubble and one was different than the other, that the outcome was different than the other. When we launched Hubble, we had some issues. We were really lucky that we were able to address that. There's no readdressing issues with web. So the only way to, to make sure that it's done right 
is by proving many, many times over again via by test or analysis that we're going to get the same results. So we, we've definitely learned our lessons from things that haven't gone well in the past, and we're constantly trying to, to better the process. Awesome. So what exactly are the different kinds of like tests that you do? Do you like test the space conditions like with the materials or something like that? I'll, I'll, I'll say something about that. So um, space environment is really different than regular environment here on Earth, right? And, and even when we send something to space, if it's going to be closer to the moon, it's going to encounter different conditions than if it's going to be closer to Pluto. The temperature is gonna be different, the gravity is gonna be different. So whenever we send something to space, we identify what type of conditions specifically that thing is going to encounter. When we reproduce those to the best of our abilities, here in our planet safely, you know, because we wouldn't survive the um, conditions in space. So we need to reproduce them in a, in a space that is safe. And then we test them in that environment over and over again. So for instance, we have the, the large mirror that is made of beryllium, 6.4 meters in diameter, about 18 inches. I'm sorry, 18 feet. Um, and, and we have this really big primary and we know that when things get really cold, they're gonna change performance a little bit and that's okay. That was part of the language that Stephanie was using before. You know, we have our requirements. We want to make everything perfect, but in reality we can't. So we just need to make it good enough. So we do a lot of tests to make sure we know that things are gonna change in behavior a little bit when they get warm. We all have things that, you know, don't work the same way when temperatures are really hot or temperatures are really cold. Can you imagine when we send something really far away from our planet, away from the earth, where it's gonna be really cold, things are going to change. And, they, the, and some of that change, we want it to change. And um, we've controlled it that way. We've perfectly planned it so that it changes that way. But we need to make sure that it actually does what we design it to change. And some of it just means creating that space environment here in our planet and cycling it many times, many times, and seeing that it still does the same thing as it goes to warm and cold, warm and cold, and that means for the electronics, that means for the optics, that means for the spacecraft, that means for the sun shield. The sun shield is always going to be facing the sun. So also the sun shield is made so that it's going to um, resist that hot temperature versus the telescope where the mirror is. We want that to be really cold. So then we have to test each of the parts separately and make sure that they're going to survive for their allotted time in those conditions. Because also, like everything we send to space, um, you know, like everything in life, it doesn't live forever, right? Everything has a life cycle. The telescope eventually, the electronics are not going to last forever, right? We know every few years we need to get a new phone because eventually your phone dies. That same thing is going to happen to the telescope. So we need to make sure that within the lifespan we want for James Webb to work, everything has to work during those, those, during those years. Awesome. So how did each of you feel on December 25th, the day that James Webb launched into space? Oh man, I was a mess that day. I was filled with so many emotions, it ranging from excitement, happiness, I'm scared. It was so much. I literally, in our time, it was 4 a.m. our time here in California when it launched and it was Christmas day. So I literally went to my mom and my dad, my sister, like yelling, like, it's time, it's time, come to the living room. And they're all half asleep, but super excited with me. And we just started um, watching it. And I feel like when I was watching like the, the live broadcasting and everything, I was still, okay. I was still saying, I was like, okay, like this is going to go well. We've prepared for this. And then the moment we got to the countdown was three, two, one. And I started to take off. I started pouring crying. I, I don't know what came over me. I was like, oh my God, it's real. It's happening. It's going, there's no way back, right? Like there's no turning back now. It's going. And I was just crying probably for 30 minutes straight, just anxiously looking once with a solar array deployed. I was like, oh my God, the first deployment done. But I don't know, it was a mixture of so many beautiful emotions. Um, my coworkers and I were all had texting like, oh my God, it's happening. It's going so well. But yeah, I can't explain it with words what I felt, but it was beautiful feelings all at the same time. Absolutely similar. Th thankfully, uh, Stephanie, over in the East Coast, it was seven in the morning, so we didn't have to wake up <laughs> so terribly early. But my sister was visiting my husband and myself, and we set up our alarms. I was like, that was the perfect Christmas gift. 
Um, and my sister woke up around six and she's like, did I miss it? Did I miss it? She hadn't realized at what time it was yet. Um, and that was it. You know, we all went to the living room and wanted to watch it and be able to witness. And actually, um, the optics branch at Goddard, they made a, a Teams meeting. So we were all able to sort of connect to the Teams meeting together as we all watched the live uh, performance. And it was just like a performance broadcast because it was it was such a beautiful thing. And it's taken, you know, it's taken three decades for us to get here. So it was sort of like the, the culmination of this effort for launch. And now we're still in really critical part because the telescope is still not fully aligned yet. And that's why I think this week has been especially exciting for myself, probably for Stephanie as well, because finally we're aligning the optical system. And this is where the optical engineers really come in is we need to make sure we tweak all of the mirrors very carefully so that we get that nice crisp image that we're going to be taking you know, once we have that camera aligned, that telescope aligned, we'll be able to do all the science we've been waiting for this telescope to do. Wow, that must be a once in a lifetime kind of a moment. So what do each of you think was the most exciting thing that the telescope has discovered so far? It hasn't been able to discover anything yet. So it's not ready to do discoveries yet. Only this week have we been able to start um, tweaking the alignment. So right now it's in the alignment stage. It only got to the L2 point, the, the like Grand Jam 2 point, which is a very stable point in our, our universe. It only got there very recently. And the first thing that it did is that it pointed at a really bright star that it was by itself. And it pointed at that star and all the different 18 segments pointed at that star and they were able to create an image on the detector. We knew that that first image was gonna be a little bit of a mess because the telescope is not aligned yet. The primary mirror is not aligned yet. So this week, actually only three days ago, that they start tweaking the alignment of each of the segments so that now we have a picture of that star. Um, it's still in the 18 segments. We wanna bring that to be one one um but now it sort of makes a little bit more sense so they're in the very early stages of the alignment and we expect that this process is still going to take multiple weeks um so we really should be expecting to get some science maybe towards the end of the year but the, really the alignment process and making sure the communication and the telescope is doing everything it's supposed to do takes quite a bit of time also like i mentioned before the temperature that it encounters is really cold and now it's already there, but it takes a long time to very stably to reach that temperature in a very stable way where that everything is in that temperature um, together. So that also takes a little bit of time. So at this point now, unfortunately, the hard part for all of us is that we have to sort of patiently wait for everything to finish getting to that working state so that we can start getting some science in. Yeah, and to add to what Margaret said, I definitely feel like the waiting game is the hardest of all. But even though Webb isn't starting to make any science discoveries yet, I think to me, one of the amazing things it has done thus far is getting through our deployment phase. We had multiple deployments on the telescope with over 100 single point failures, meaning if just one of them failed, that was it for the mission. And being able to get through all of that and successfully deploying everything to get us to our Lagrange 2 point, I think it's definitely an amazing thing Webb has done. It's not discovery, but it's definitely performance of it. I, I think it's amazing. That's awesome. So forgot to shout out that question was from Ms. Carter's class. And we also have another audience question. Ms. Smith's fourth graders want to know if you will be able to see other planets. Yes, that is one of the objectives of, of, of Webb. It's going to be looking at exoplanets. And exoplanets are planets potentially similar to our planet in the sense that they exist in a solar system that has the bright sun in the center and some of the planets orbiting around it and could potentially have water and therefore could potentially harbor life similar to our life. And that is like one of the fundamental questions that we're always asking as human beings. Are we alone in our universe? And James Webb is going to be able to help us study, identify and study planets that could potentially be similar to ours to try to answer that question. That's an amazing capability. So what's the farthest object that you can detect with this telescope? Stephanie, do you want to give that a go? Let me know. 
You can go ahead. I don't have a precise answer for that one. <laughs> I think that's really challenging. And I have to say, um, you know, Stephanie and myself are not astronomers. And you know, we're working on this telescope that is a really cool telescope, and it is only possible because it is the combination, you know, of thousands of people of us working together with different disciplines. Um, but astronomers are the ones that really know all of the science questions. So we I think Stephanie and I are doing our best trying to answer these things. The mostly we want to know just for ourselves, right? Because we think that this is really cool and we want to know. Um the full disclosure, because we're not astronomers, we're not able to know, you know, some of the nitty gritty details of the science here, but James Webb will be able to look back in time. So when you can imagine uh, a star explodes in our universe, because that's just its natural life cycle and it explodes, um, there's a lot of light that's going to come out of that explosion. And as light travels to through our universe, and we know that our universe is expanding, that light is going to change in wavelength. It sort of is going to stretch. And that's what we, we call red shifting. So because that, that visible and ultraviolet light is going to stretch through our expanding universe, by the time it gets all the way to James Webb, it's going to become infrared light, which means that it's going to allow us to look back in time, 13 million years back in time to some of these earlier um, um, origins of our universe. We know that our universe is really old. So um, in order for our universe to take place, a lot of these explosions had to happen. And by the time the light gets to James Webb, it will allow us to look back in time into the early um, bursts of light that we had in our universe. So it's, it's really exciting because we don't have a telescope like this that will allow us to see this back in time with this size of a primary mirror that is able to look in the infrared. These are just, that's why we're so excited. That's why this is so freaking exciting. We've never been able to get here before. So um, the key is now being able to get the telescope aligned, get it working and start pointing at different parts of the universe that allow us to see um, these, this early light to help us understand, to help us better understand our evolving universe. You know, the universe is so massive. 95% um, is dark energy and dark matter that we don't quite really know what this is. So can you imagine that only 5% of our universe is something that we can actually see? Whatever you see in the night sky, you know, the, our, our sun, our planets, our solar system, other galaxies nearby, all of their solar systems, all the stars that you can see, that's only 5% of our universe. The rest of it is this dark something that we don't know what it is. And James Webb is going to help us understand what that is. It's really exciting. That's amazing. And I had no idea that you can look back so far in time based on, like you were talking about the, the stars and the light. So we have another audience question. Lauren wants to know about why gold was used in the mirror and why is the mirror the shape it is? Margaret, so I'm going to have to take this one. <laughs> I was so <laughs> that, That's a great question. And, and I'll say that I can't answer it because I'm an optical engineer. There's lots of other questions that I wouldn't be able to answer and that Stephanie would have to answer for me. So because this is a telescope, an optical uh, designers have to design the telescope. Um, in this specific question, I get a little bit of an advantage. So specifically, it's gold coated because gold is very efficient in the infrared. Not because it's very expensive, that doesn't make it any better or any worse. Actually, like Hubble is not gold coated. And it's not because we didn't have enough money to gold code Hubble. Hubble is a telescope that is operational in the visible and ultraviolet. And the most efficient type of material for that wavelength would be um, silver. So then it's going to look, it's gonna have a different coating. Because we are operating in the infrared, we know that the most efficient coating, the most efficient material that's going to reflect most of the light is going to be gold. That's why we chose that. Awesome, so this question's for Stephanie. What project are you working on now? Yeah, so I'm actually working on a brand new project it's um, unfortunately I can't talk much about it, but it's definitely I feel like when I started at web five years ago, it was kind of like at the end of its lifespan. So I worked, like I mentioned before, like on the requirements and verification aspect of it. So it was a lot of like, okay, these requirements are already written. We know what needs to happen. Testing is being performed. 
how are we going to verify them, right? And getting all of that work done. Now with my new job, it's more of like the opposite. I'm starting somewhere where it's brand new work. I'm writing requirements from scratch and it it's amazing what the web people must have done early on to make write thousands of requirements to make sure everything works correctly. So I'm in that boat now. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's so hard going on the other side. So definitely working on new things, the other side of system engineering, writing requirements on a brand new program. But fortunately, that's all I can say. <laughs> awesome. So Margaret, what projects are you working on now? So in NASA, we're always thinking long term, right? So, you know, we Hubble is 30 years old. We've been working on James Webb for 30 years and we've just launched James Webb and that's really exciting. But what's next? We need to be working on what the, the next 30 years of NASA projects are going to be like. So um, I talked about the decadal survey, right? Every 10 years, we evaluate what are the what are the most important astronomy questions that we have to answer for this decade. The winner of the decadal survey in the year 2000 was James Webb. The winner of the decadal survey from the year 2010 is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. And that's what I'm working on now. So I'm working on the successor for James Webb. And what we are hoping with the successor, which is called Roman, is that it's going to be working with Webb. So we're planning to launch it within the next decade. It's going to be a little bit smaller than Webb. So the size of Hubble is about the size of a school bus. James Webb fits on a tennis court. Roman will be similar to Hubble. It'll be about the size of a school of a school bus, but unlike unlike Hubble, that is only about 350 miles away from our planet. James Webb is one million miles away. Roman is also going to be one million miles away in the infrared, working with James Webb. Of course, in order for them to work together, they need to have complementing capabilities. So James Webb will have this infrared detector and will have really high resolution. Roman, unlike Webb, will have a really large field of view. So you know those selfies that people want to take where they want to catch most of the crowd? We want to bring in that field of view. We've designed it so it has a really large field of view. It is going to have the same resolution as Hubble. It is going to have 100 times the field of view of Hubble. So you can imagine Hubble would take pictures of something in the sky and now what it would take 400 times for Hubble to take with Webb, with Roman, we can just take three pictures and we'd be doing it much faster and in a different wavelength. So it's gonna be able to work really cool with Webb because it'll be able to look at really large parts of the sky and say, oh, over there, there's something interesting. Let's point Webb and take a high resolution image and see what's happening there. And that's going to be awesome to have that complemented capability. And I'm building one of the components that's called GRISM that will be on board Roman that we're expected to launch in the next few years. Awesome. So we have another audience question. Nancy wants to know what skills are important in your jobs. I think there's a variety of skills that are important. I think for me, what's proven to be the most needed, and it's not even a technical school skill, it's a communication skill. I felt like having good communication skills has definitely played the biggest role so far in my career and getting things done. Again, if you can't communicate officially the work you're doing, how is the other person supposed to understand the work you're doing? So for me, if you can work communication skills, I think that's one of the best things you can do. Um, I've learned, I have sometimes there's things I don't fully comprehend, but being able to communicate with my peers, ask questions, and then based on what I learned, teach others and communicate that has helped get us to where we are today. Awesome. Margaret, do you have anything to add? Obviously, I have to completely agree with Stephanie. Communication is key. And it's key to every profession, right? Think about, you know, whatever job out there. If you're not communicating effectively, then how are you conveying ideas? You can have a really brilliant scientist come up with a wonderful idea. If that person can't communicate it to their peers, then the idea is lost. So it's important to communicate, but it's also important to like um, to be willing to learn, right? So as engineers, we're always really curious by nature, but we have to be able to understand, you know, sort of our limitations and say, this is what I know, this is what I don't know, and be willing to learn that. The ability to be able to, to want to learn, to ask the questions, and to be, you know, tech savvy. 
And that doesn't mean you need to learn everything or you need to be brilliant at math. That means you need to be willing to learn something about it. So being flexible is also really key. Awesome. So Alyssa wants to know how you decided that you wanted to be an engineer. I think in my case, how I ended up deciding. So unfortunately, I didn't go to elementary, middle or high schools that really pursued um, STEM degrees such as engineering. But I knew I loved math growing up. I always loved it. I think I was always pretty good at it. So I knew I wanted a career that would have a lot of math in it. I, I knew I didn't really want to be a teacher though. So I'm like, okay, what career options are there? So then I started Googling, right? I was like, what careers are there with math? And ironically enough, around the same time, I was watching the new Transformers or the, at the time was the new Transformers movie, the very first one. And there's a scene where the girl finds out um, that they're hacking into the, the, the bad robots are hacking into the system. And she makes the discovery and lets people know. And I was like, I wouldn't be that girl. And they're like, I wouldn't work in a place like that. So I started researching what are the different engineering careers that had to do with that. And it ended up being similar to computer engineering. So Ironically, between the love of math and the Transformers movie is what got me to pursue a computer engineering degree. Also, Margaret, how did you decide that you wanted to be an engineer? That's such a great story. I feel like my story is not as exciting as Stephanie's story. <laughs> um, but I think that that is what makes it really wonderful that we all, um, all of the engineers that I work with have found their own way because they thought in one way or another, it's a really cool thing to do. So similar to Stephanie, of course, as we find you know, a lot of similarities in our tracks, um, I also really always loved math. I thought math was really cool and it was something I really liked to do. Um, and, I, and I, um, growing up in Mexico, the, um, the access to education is a little bit harder, only about less than 5% of the population in Mexico goes to college. So the, really the focus on education is not, is not where we'd want it to be. So it was also a little bit challenging there. Um, but I had uh, really supportive parents that you know, believed that even though they weren't sure where my passion for science and math was gonna land me, they were going to support me. And, and when I decided to study physics, um, they thought that eventually that would open a lot of doors for me. And I didn't know that I wanted to be an engineer. It wasn't until I got to my internship at NASA and I learned what optical engineers were doing that I was like, I want to be an optical engineer. That's so amazing. Each of you had such different stories and y'all both ended up in such cool careers. So we have another audience question. Sarah Nosi's class wants to know what your favorite thing about your career is. I think in my case, my the favorite thing about my career is being able to work with people. I'm a very big people person and I can't imagine myself in a job where it's just me by myself in a room, not working with anyone. So I think for me, definitely engineering, like I mentioned before, a lot of communication and working with so many different people. And I think that's the part I personally love the most, interacting with people, learning about people. And then Sometimes you even have days where, for example, I was a test engineer at some point when I was working on web, and there were times that we had to work the night shift, which is basically getting here like at 8 p.m. all the way to 6 a.m., and you bond during those times. So I think to me, working around people and always having them around me to teach me new things I've never known before, I think is my favorite part about my job. I also really like working um, for people. I think one of the hardest things at the pandemic for myself was that I really enjoyed being in the lab and being able to work with people. Um, my husband is also a NASA engineer and he's, he's also an optical engineer and he's a designer and he very much loves to be home doing his design at home. <laughs> he's very happy that way and there are lots of people like that. But I really like being in the lab and, and the ability to sort of put something together and understand how we make it and build it and test it and test what doesn't work, right? So a lot of the important things that we do at NASA in the process is identify how to do something and also how not to do something, right? Some of the questions don't always have the answer that we expect and that is okay. That's what helps us narrow down the process of what we should be doing. So I really like working with people as well. And, and having that ability to learn from other people as well, right? Because we have all these brilliant people that have been, we know, 
working at places like NASA or Northrop or other really big companies. And, you know, eventually they're going to retire and I want to be able to be as cool as they were and, you know, and, and learn from all the wonderful things and experience that they've had to be able to, to learn it and develop it more for myself and then to share it with the person that's going to be doing this after me. So, so the ability to be able to, to learn, to explore, to ask questions, to answer questions and to do that as a team is a wonderful thing. That's awesome. So we have another audience question. Gabriella wants to know if either of you had mentors or role models in your career. Definitely. I think Margo probably can attest to this. I think every individual needs like mentors in their life, regardless of the career. And um, when I mentioned I started as an intern, my manager on web, she's amazing. I love her. And she's been my mentor and she's taught me so many things. I look up to her so much. And sometimes they don't have to officially be your mentor. Like Margaret was mentioned, you can learn so much from individuals that have been here for years. They have so much knowledge that it's like, I want to go pick out, like, tell me everything you know, let me understand it. So uh, yeah, definitely mentorship is something that if currently someone doesn't have it, I highly, highly suggest it. It's helped me so much in my career. Even looking for my next assignment, I went to her and other mentors, like, what do you recommend I do for my next role? What do you think I would like? I mean, they've known me very well as well. So definitely for different things, both on the job, career moves, and even life things. I've talked to many engineers. How have you done it? Like say having kids, like how did you work around that? Getting even life mentorship from your peers is very important. Margaret, how about you? Absolutely. You know, it's really important. And mentors can have different shapes, forms, and sizes, right? Like every every mentor, I feel like sometimes the word mentor feels like maybe it's this old, you know, person that has white hair and a long beard. I don't know. That's what I think when I think of this word mentor, like it's really heavy, somebody that's really wise, that's really old. And that's not true, right? A mentor can be somebody that maybe is even your age. It doesn't matter what what their gender, their age, you know, or their or their profession is. We can have mentors in different forms because we can identify, we can have things in common with different people. And it doesn't matter, you know, what they look like or what they do or what they are. They have something that we can learn from. We can learn from everybody. Um, so I think identifying somebody that can help you achieve what you want to do. And sometimes the help comes in the way of you just need to vent for 10 minutes, right? Like it's just been an awful day and you just need to be able to somebody that can hear you um, or allow you to hear yourself is really important because ultimately we can never get anywhere by ourselves. You know, both Stephanie and myself, I'm sure Stephanie can, can agree with this. You know, we're only here because it's the result of multiple people supporting us throughout the way. And that can be friends, family, um, mentors. You know, we, we cannot get here by ourselves. So it's important for us to have a network. So for all of those of you out there that, you know, are not sure how to, how to get there, you know, reach out. I've had dozens of students approach me through LinkedIn that have just questions about grad school and how do you get there and what do you do and about funding and about, you know, do I really want to do this? Do I not want to do this? And just being able to talk to somebody that maybe can share some of your fears, some of your concerns with you um, is also, it sort of just makes you feel like you're not alone. And sometimes that's really important. And I think a mentor helps you feel that way. That's awesome. I can really see how important having a mentor or role model is on your career. So we have our final question is from Mr. Travers's class. And either one of you can go first. What do you do when you're not at work? What are your hobbies and interests? Um, yeah, I, I can go first. Um, <laughs> sometimes I feel like I don't have a life outside of work, but when I do take the time to do things other than just sleep all day, I do love to go hiking. It's something me and my fiance love to do, just getting outdoors. I feel like we're most of the time indoors working. So definitely getting some sun, hiking, um, going for runs, walks. That's definitely what I like to do with my hobbies. And then the, obviously spending time with friends and family. I think that's that's literally what I spend my weekends doing. Margaret, how about you? I completely agree getting out. My husband and I try to go for daily walks, even though when I'm running tests, like what Stephanie was saying, you know, sleeping in the lab, it's not sleeping, but you know, you're there like all night. It feels like you should be sleeping. Um, you know, when I'm running tests like that, which I 
I'm actually running one of those right now. And I was in the lab all day yesterday and I'll be there tomorrow. And I'm really happy I was able to be here today. Um, you know, I'm not able to, to do these daily walks, but I really like to do that. Even if we just, you know, go around the block, just get outside and get some air. I'm also a jazzercise instructor, which is a dance fitness activity. I find that doing exercise in any way is really helpful for me to be able to sleep well, for me to feel good, you know, mentally, physically. So I, I really like to do that. And I love to travel. My family is lives in different countries, which is perfect because I love to be able to travel. So whenever it's, it's safe to do so, I like to be able to visit my family and travel around a little bit. That all sounds really fun. Well, I believe that that's all the questions we have time for today. A huge thanks to both Margaret and Stephanie for joining us. I learned a lot. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank this was awesome. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. When you leave today, please fill out our survey. And be sure to join us for our next Chats with Changemakers. Tune in on Thursday, March 31st at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time when we will chat with Katie, a bridge design engineer who ensures public safety by evaluating old bridges and designing new ones. See you next time.